Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, we're going to be talking about one of nature's most dangerous phenomena when it comes to aviation. We're going to be talking about volcanic ash. What is volcanic ash? What does it do to the aircraft? And how are we, the pilots, trained to deal with it? So stay tuned. Alright guys, this video is brought to you in cooperation with Brilliant.org. Now, Brilliant.org is a website that will help you improve on your math and your physics skills. I only endorse companies that I think will be beneficial for you guys, and Brilliant.org is one of those, so check out the link below. On the 24th of June 1982, uh, British Airways 747 um, Flight 9 was flying over Jakarta, Indonesia. When they started noticing a weird light, kind of a blue light like St. Elmo's fire traveling over the windscreens in the cockpit. They thought it was weird because there was no reports of any kind of uh, thunderstorm activity in the area and it was supposed to be a clear sky night. Soon after that, they, uh, they got reports from the, um, from the cabin that the passengers was complaining about a bluish and yellowish light coming around the engine inlets and around the leading edges. And they also started noticing kind of a, a mist developing in the um, inside of the cabin. Now they thought that that might be cigarette smoke because smoking cigarettes was allowed back then. But following this, all the engines started misbehaving and they started losing engines 4, 3, 1 and 2. So they ended up with no engines at all, right? which was unheard of in a 747 back then. Now these guys had no idea what they were encountering. They, they descended down, they were planning on possibly ditching into the sea, but they around 14,000 feet they started getting uh, the engines started again and they managed to, uh, they managed to land the aircraft safely, but they had to fly almost completely without visible um, or visuals because they could not see through the windows. Now, what these guys had encountered was a high concentration of volcanic ash, okay, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Now, in order to understand why volcanic ash is so dangerous for um, for aircraft, you need to understand what it is. Volcanic ash is essentially teeny tiny little rocks, part of lava that has exploded during the eruption and it can travel for thousands of kilometers away from the volcano. Uh, it's less than two millimeters in, um, in diameter, most of it is much less than that and you'll notice that if you take the ash, which looks like a powder, and you rub it against something like glass, it will almost immediately uh, make the glass opaque. It's like a sandpaper. And that's because the, these tiny little rocks are extremely sharp, okay? Um, and what you will notice if you're flying in through an ash cloud, it's exactly what these guys of flight, of BA Flight 9 noticed, which is the first thing, is that kind of St. Elmo's fire, the, the blue light traveling over. And that's because of the static um, energy that's being built up by the particles rubbing over the surface of the aircraft. The second thing is going to be that the windows are starting to uh, glaze over, or starting to be sandpapered. And that's because of the, you know, the, uh, these particles essentially sandpapering not only the, the glass, but the entire aircraft. Uh, the glow that's coming from the leading edges and the engine inlets is also because of the static buildup. So then there's going to be these particles being sucked in through the bleed air system, being pumped into the cabin, and you're going to have this kind of sulfurous smell, uh, smell of burnt or burnt electrics. Now, what happens after that is that potentially these um, Particles are also clogging up the pitot-static system. So that you might start getting erroneous um, speed indications. And also, remember how the jet engines work. The jet engines would be sucking in enormous volumes of air into the engine. If that air is full of little volcanic rocks, that will do a lot of damage. It will start by sandpapering down and potentially altering the aerodynamic uh, features of the fan and then it will be going into the core of the engine. Inside of the core of the engine, in the burn chambers, it might be up to 
1,000 degrees Celsius, even higher than that. And that is above the melting point of the volcanic ash. So the volcanic ash will melt and then it will form glass that will attach to all of the components inside of the burn chamber and following the burn chamber. So potentially on the, um, on the fuel nozzles, for example, uh, on the turbine blades and when it does, it might cause flame out because it might clog the fuel nozzles and it will also change the aerodynamic features of the internal components that might cause a pressure to build up inside of the engine that stops the air from entering and causes the engine to surge. Now remember that this is happening to all of your engines at once because you're flying in the area of high concentration of volcanic ash both engines or all four engines in the case of flight 9 will have the same problems and that's why they flamed out more or less at the same time so this is not something that we definitely want to avoid okay uh, there are volcanic ash advisory centers around the world that is monitoring the uh, volcanic eruptions and is forecasting where ash clouds might occur this is then given to the airlines in the form of an ash tam which is an ash notice to airmen uh, where the flight planning departments of the airlines will be able to reroute any flights that is predicted to be in the area where the concentration of ash is so high that it's deemed to be a no-fly zone. So this is what we do. We always try to avoid getting into the problem in the first place. And we do that by forecasting this and avoid being in the area. Then on top of that, there are very precise procedures that has to be followed by um, flight planning departments uh, and also by pilots. We get to that in a second. So let's say that you're out flying and there is a sudden eruption that wasn't forecasted and you are flying towards an area of high uh, concentration of volcanic ash. What you have to do then to, to, uh, to see it is very hard because the weather radar will not work. The weather radar is made to, to uh, predict uh, or to see water content, high levels of water, and the ash cloud does not have that. So you won't see it on the weather radar. You will see as you're entering that if you're in darkness, the landing lights or the lights will be showing very, very defined contours rather than being dispersed like it is inside of a cloud. And also, you will, um, you will see all of these effects that we just talked about. The potential St. Elmo's fire, the glow around the engine inlets, the um, possible fog inside, and then erroneous uh, airspeed indications and subsequently engine uh, stalls and failures. So this means that you have to deal with this fairly quickly. And what we are trained to do, and if you've been following me on Instagram, you saw that last week I was actually doing this kind of training. So if you're not following me on Instagram, you should definitely do that, okay? Mentor underline pilot. So what we train people to do in the simulator is that if they find themselves inside of an ash cloud, they have to immediately get out. And the quickest way of doing that is to turn 180 degrees around because you came from an area where there was no ash, now you're in an area with ash, so you turn 180 degrees around, heading select. Next thing is to start descent. Put a lower altitude, maybe the minimum sector altitude in your, um, in your area. Uh, start to descend, disconnect the outer throttle, close the thrust levers. And that's to avoid getting the engines to suck in that large amount of um, uh, volcanic ash into the engines. And also, as the, uh, the thrusts are being closed, the temperature inside of the core will decrease and possibly stop the um, volcanic ash from melting and attaching to the components. So it's very important and can save the engines from even um, flaming out in the first place. The next thing that we have to do once we've done this initial maneuver is to tell air traffic control that we're doing this because we've not been clear to descend. So we call a mayday call, tell them that we have encountered volcanic ash and that we're descending in which direction we're going so that can move traffic away and stop other traffic from flying into the area. Then we have a quick reference handbook, our QRH, that has a checklist for volcanic ash that has to be gone through because it will give indications of, for example, rem reminding us to put masks on if we feel that the air we're breathing is not safe. It will also tell us to increase the bleed demand in the engines. Uh, that's with wing NTIs, engine NTIs, and the pack switches, our air conditioning packs to high. That's to remove the pressure inside of the engine. Remember the um, pressure that we talked about, if the ash started to be attached to the engine component, that the pressure inside of the engine could start building up and that would force the, um, the air forward instead of backwards. 
Um, so by increasing the bleed demand, we are basically stopping that from happening, potentially, at least helping it from happening. So you might be able to keep the engine thrust going without the engines stalling. Um, then it will just tell you, advise you to potentially start the APU, the auxiliary power unit, in order to give you electrical power if you've lost both engines. This is something that you'd have to think about a little bit. If you're inside of the Ash Cloud, maybe you want to wait a little bit to avoid that from stalling as well. And then it's going to lead you into potentially doing the checklist for the loss of thrust on both engines. But we'll discuss that in a different episode. The, the aim anyway of this entire thing is to try to maintain thrust on at least one of the engines. Um, so that you can make a safe landing at an airport somewhere. So this is what you're trying to achieve. Once you get down to the airport... Um, Obviously, engineering is going to have to go through the aircraft and you can expect some really expensive damages if you've been in an area with high concentration of volcanic ash. The Flight 9, and there was also an incident with a KLM flight back in uh, 1989 that also lost trust in all four engines. Um, they had damages, about $80 million worth of damages on the aircraft. That's because the um, volcanic ash affects almost every part of the aircraft. It it uh, damages the windshields, it damages pitted probes, other probes as well. It can destroy the engines by building up uh, glass inside of them. And also, the, the uh, air conditioning system is now full of ash. And the fuel tanks are being pressurized by uh, the air conditioning system in order to keep the pumps from cavitating at high altitude. So, if the, um, the bleeder has been pushing volcanic ash into the fuel tanks, it will also be full of ash inside of the fuel tanks, which could in turn cause a later engine failure. So the fuel tanks have to be completely either replaced or cleaned. So as you can see, uh, avoiding getting into an area with volcanic ash is the highest priority of both pilots and airlines. Okay, And if you do enter an area with volcanic ash, you have to know what to do. And this is what the pilots are being trained to do. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, I hope you have um, gotten the Mentor Aviation app as well so that you can discuss this with me or other pilots. Uh, and check out brilliant.org, guys. I know I keep telling you to do that, but I do mean it. I only, um, I only want you guys to become better at the areas you need to be better at in order to be successful in your airline interview or in your flight school interview. Uh, an area of Brilliant.org that I would like you to check out is physics of every day, okay? If you don't know what the Coriolis effect is, then either use the link below, find out, learn about it, or you are going to have to learn about it as part of your ATPL theory. The 256 first of you who use this link below will have a 20% discount of the yearly subscription of Brilliant.org, but it's completely free to check it out. So do that. I can almost guarantee that you'll find it enjoyable. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>